Could you please introduce yourself? Who are you? What do you do? So I am an associate professor and the chair of the uh, economics department at the University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And to get into your work, you work on specific, specifically price theory. I wanted to know how should we think about the economy and how should we think about prices in an abstract, broad sense? Yeah, I think that uh, kind of the fundamental thing about price theory is thinking about everything in terms of relative prices. Mm -hmm. we, a lot of times when we think of prices because everything is priced in terms of money, we tend to think of like money prices. But if you think about the real cost of things, and if you think about how you evaluate, like whether I should buy this thing or that thing, what you're really thinking about is like, what am I giving up by buying this, right? Because we all have some amount of income. And so we're constrained, right? We can't have everything that we want all the time. And so if we decide to purchase one thing, like that, that means that we have to forego purchasing some other thing. But the thing about price theory is it essentially says that, well, we don't just have to think about that in the context of like buying and selling goods. We can also think about that just in the context of everyday life, right? So the time uh, that I spend doing something is time that I can't spend doing something else, right? And so the same basic principles kind of uh, apply when you're thinking about time or whether you're thinking about purchases or whatever. Mm. So this is kind of the concept of opportunity costs. So how important is opportunity cost then in, in all of economics? Is it one of the most important concepts to you? I think that some people would actually say that like opportunity cost is kind of like the most important thing because mm. the idea is that this is what we really mean in economics by cost is opportunity cost, right? If I'm buying bananas, um, that means I can't buy apples or oranges or something like that. And that, but that's an opportunity cost, right? Um, if I'm spending my time, uh, you know, writing a paper, that's time I can't spend grading exams or uh, walking in the park or something, right? So everything that you do uh, has costs, but those costs are really opportunity costs. And what price theory specifically is designed to do is to kind of get you to really focus on those opportunity costs rather than the sort of everyday monetary costs that we see in, in real life. Interesting. And more broadly, how would you say an economist thinks and approaches problems differently, say to other fields or even to, to non-economists, to everyday an everyday person? I think probably the biggest thing is that what's always foremost in our mind is that people face like uh, constraints, right? There's constraints on your time. Uh, there's, you know, constraints on your budget. Um, but, you know, there's also resource constraints in the world. And so like the, you know, we kind of start every like intro class by saying, look, everybody can't have everything that they want all the time. And so how do we allocate those resources? And that's fundamentally what economics is about. But you know, when you, um, but when you're, when you're so focused on these uh, constraints, it really forces you to think about trade-offs. And so a lot of times uh, you'll hear people talking about like, oh, here's the policy solution for this problem. But economists are very hesitant to call like, you know, for policy solutions, right? Because the idea is, is that every policy has trade-offs. So there's always going to be some cost and benefit. And part of the job of, of the economist is to try to figure out you know, what are the costs and what are the, the benefits? A related question I wanted to ask was, what do non-economists get wrong, say, about econ economics? Would trade-offs be one of them? Or, or would you have another answer to that? Yeah, I think that's the thing, because a lot of times uh, people are looking... Um, th there's a saying in economics that like there are no solutions there are only trade-offs mm -hmm. and i think this is fundamentally what separates economists a lot of times people get frustrated with economists because they're like well yeah if we do that you know it has this benefit but you know at the same time like there, you know there's going to be some some cost and there's a there's a very famous line um by a former uh u.s president harry truman um, and he said uh, he just wanted a one-handed economist because all every time he would ask for an advice uh, advice from his uh, economic advisors, they'd say, "Well, on the one hand, you know, it does this, but on the other hand, you know, it does this." 
And he's like, just give me a one-handed economist. I don't, I won't, I don't want the, on the one hand, on the other hand. Hmm. On this maybe same theme, I, well, I phrased the question in my notes as this, which is who is your most underrated economist? But maybe a better question would be who is a popular economist you like that, but an underrated idea of theirs? Uh, I don't know. I guess this is kind of actually uh, a, a deep question. I don't know. I, I think one, so one guy who's completely underappreciated, I think in economics, but not outside of economics is a guy like Thomas Sowell. Hmm. And I think the reason is, is that Sowell has written a lot about economics, but he's also written a lot about, uh, about politics. And so he's like very sort of like kind of conservative libertarian ish. Right. And, uh, and so a lot of people kind of neglect his work because they just think maybe he's an ideologue. Uh, but he's done like some really interesting stuff and like, and he's really, really good at, you know, uh, using economics as a guide for sort of like deductive reasoning about, you know, difficult topics. Um, so I would say, even though it sounds kind of crazy, he would be one of them. Uh, the guy who, uh, who I should say, uh, is the guy that we use as our logo on our newsletter, Economic Forces, which is Armin Alshin. And Armin Alshin uh, was just an, incre an incredible economist, um, but he was uh, he was generally writing for economists, and he was also um, he he also had a, a different kind of style. So he liked to, you know, e economists have kind of uh, become more mathematical over time, and Alshin was actually like, uh, you know very skilled at at math he had a background in statistics um but he would really try to use math when he needed it but then he would take it out of the paper and um and so the math was kind of to check his logical reasoning but then in the papers he would kind of remove that but the difficulty is is that sometimes i, I mean an underrated aspect of using math in your research is that people can follow your logic very uh, easily. And so when you kind of remove that math, now you have to explain this in words and contrary to popular belief, uh, it can be more, it can be very difficult to explain things using words. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of known for, you know, some like dense writing, but he's really, really insightful. Um, and he was one of these guys that really emphasized that like, look, all costs are opportunity costs and we need to always sort of frame every question in terms of thinking about opportunity costs. But he had a lot of, you know, he had a lot of work that was probably deserving of, uh, of a Nobel Prize in economics, but but he never really got it. Um, right. And uh, it was just kind of that the the field kind of went in a, in a different direction, but he was incredibly insightful and uh, you can learn a lot from him. And, and because he wrote without all of the math, the people who don't have like a, a math background or, or people who, um, want to get an intro to economics like I mean his work can still be challenging to read because it's very uh, thoughtful and and dense but um, but also you, there's no maybe the uh, the startup cost is a little lower because you don't have to know all of these models or something like that before you start reading you touched there on economists of the past and to what degree one might want to go back and read them and think about them to what degree does someone do we like go back to people like Adam Smith or these kind of economists and and they do use less math so could you comment on to what degree is there benefits from doing that and what can you say about the fact that they did use less math what does that what does that mean about economics today well like anything there's costs and benefits so I mean I have written papers with no math and I've written papers with a lot of math and I think it just Kind of for me, it just kind of depends on the topic and and the audience. Um, I I don't think I mean there 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 are aspects of economics that are sort of like overly mathematical, where um, you know uh, we are economists after all, we're not mathematicians, and um, and if we try to be mathematicians, we're going to be poor mathematicians, and so you know, there is an aspect of, of some of this stuff that gets into that territory where it's kind of like a poor man's mathematician doing economics. Mm -hmm. um, 
But on the other hand, you know, like I said, you know, math actually really does help us because it helps us to keep our logic consistent. It helps us to make sure that we're not uh, making some logical leap um, that we could make potentially with words uh, that's not going to be possible uh, with math. Um, but, you know, at the same time, there's a lot of value in a lot of this older stuff. I think I disagree with a lot of people who kind of, uh, there, there are a lot of people in the profession who say like, oh, we don't need to read like the, the stuff of old economists because whatever was valuable has been sort of carried forward into what we're studying. And I think that that's wrong um, in part because what we know about some of these people is like, uh, I don't know if you ever did this as a child, but um, as a child, uh, in like elementary school, we would play like a game of telephone. And so you would, all the kids in the class would sit in a circle and the one kid would um, would just come up with a sentence and he would say it to the kid after him. And then it would just go all the way around and then you'd just whisper it in the kid next to you's ear and it would go all the way around the right. circle and then it would come back to you. And then you, and then you would hear what the, the last person thought the sentence was. And it was almost always completely uh -huh. you know different from whatever the original sentence was and i think there's a lot of that in sort of interpretations of the history of economic thought is that people there's kind of this well adam smith said this and then the next person's like well adam smith said this and it just mm -hmm. kind of becomes this game of telephone where eventually it's kind of like well did he say that or like is it more nuanced than that um and so like you can actually go back and read uh adam smith and you can and you can get you know genuine insights and and also you can get an appreciation for how deep some of these insights are given the fact that like he's not working with the the amount of literature that like people like me have today to draw on to to get insights interesting and in that sense in a way it can sometimes be they have to be readable because of their insights and the way they articulated ideas so in a way sometimes there's value in going back to it because of that and they and they didn't how they couldn't rely on other people's work as well in some senses like i'm often amazed looking back at summer smith and it's where he's 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 speaking on a huge range of topics as well so that's very interesting i on a different note i wanted to ask what your views are of behavioral economics and debates about rationality versus irrationality i guess over the last couple of decades there's been a sort of rise of oh we do experiments and we see people are irrational or supposedly that's what we say i'm interested what is behavioral economics place in economics and what should we make of people being irrational versus rational yeah i'm kind of torn on this because in some sense i find some of the puzzles that behavioral economists pose as interesting but like there's this weird thing that goes on in behavioral economics where they'll say things like um, they'll take a model that we have and they'll say, OK, people don't actually behave the way that um, we predict them to behave in this model. Um, but then they kind of say like, but they should actually behave that way. And so we need to have policy that like pushes them in that direction or something. And it's kind of bizarre because on the one hand, it's the, the the kind of push in behavioral is to kind of come up with these different ways of modeling human behavior and thinking about human behavior. But then at the end of the day, they kind of fall back on the models that we have and essentially say, well, even though they don't behave like this model predicts, they should behave like this model predicts. And, you know, so let, let's kind of do something about that. And I find that to be like a sort of odd approach, because if the approach is people don't behave like the models, then uh, I'm very interested in tr sort of figuring out like where the model goes wrong or something like that. Mm -hmm. The idea that we just need, need to use policy to like push them to behave like the models we already have seems like a bizarre uh, conclusion to draw. Um, mm. I also think it's there's a fundamental misunderstanding here about what's going on, because economics is not um there's always this kind of critique of economics that like oh you guys just assume like everybody is like super hyper rational and mm. um and that kind of thing and the important thing to realize is that our economic models are models of economic behavior they're not models of the mind 
So we're not writing down models to explain how people think about the decisions that they're making. We're writing down models of like, um, you know, suppose that people just want to sort of maximize like their level of satisfaction or something and they have a, and, but they have a budget constraint. How do they make decisions in that context? And when you think about it like that, you know, this is a rational model, but it doesn't require that anybody is actually rational. Like it, it just provides predictions about how people are going to behave under those circumstances. And then we can check and see if people behave under those circumstances. Now in their own heads, I mean, who knows what's going on? I mean, they could have crazy uh, wild views about why they're making the decisions, but if they behave in a, in a way that's consistent with the model, um, then the model is kind of successful, right? It helps us to understand right. what the decisions that they make and, and, um, and, 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 you know, it, it's not, but it's not a theory of why they make those decisions. It's not a theory of like what they're thinking, like, uh, that's psychology, right? Like we're, we're trying to think about just how people make economic decisions in the face of, you know, their, their resource constraints. Mm -hmm. So two things that I want to touch on. One is how, as you say, contrary to maybe what people believe, we're not making models necessarily of, am I right in saying this, of individuals or we're not saying anything about how they think because actually I'm interested in what you think about how markets and institutions and these larger structures influence our behavior. And in a way that's that's kind of one of what we want to be talking about. And if, and, and, that, and therefore that, I guess I want to ask them, how does an economist approach thinking about if they don't need to think about or they really can't think about someone and what's in someone's mind, then what 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 factors should they be focused on? So I guess the basic way to think about it is like we're using uh, I, I always call this like we're using uh, we assume rational frameworks, not rational people. And so. The idea is, is we can think about, you know, what like the basic objectives of people are. Like, I assume that people like to have more stuff to less stuff, right? Um, I assume that, you know, how much you value something probably depends on how much you already have of that thing. Um, those are really kind of basic um, assumptions about behavior. And then I can assume that, look, you've got some, uh, you've got some level of income. And you can observe the prices of the goods when you, you know, walk into a, a store or, or you're walking through some kind of market. And so you have to make those decisions. And it's fundamentally just about like the opportunity costs of those decisions. Uh, but, you know, the opportunity costs are going to depend on those things like, you know, how much do I already have, uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. And so the idea is, is that this helps to frame economic decision making with very very like uh modest assumptions about human behavior right like that i would prefer to have more stuff to less stuff i mean that seems like a really uh modest assumption right um but with the, from those assumptions then we can generate all kinds of predictions about human behavior what choices that they make and, and that sort of thing um, but also the choices that they make depend on sort of institutional environment, right? So um, kind of in the background is that, you know, a lot of times when these models don't make good predictions, it's because there's something that's being neglected, like institutions. And so if you think about, you know, something like property rights, when you're actually trading, what you're really trading oftentimes is property rights, right? Like um, if I sell you an apple, um, you know, like I'm actually giving you the the property right to that apple, right? Now the apple belongs to you. You can exclude other people from using it. If you want to turn around and sell it to somebody else, that's now your, your right. Um, and so if you're in a scenario where property rights are, are not well-defined uh, or property rights aren't enforced uh, or there's some restriction on your, on your property rights, um, like for example, maybe, um, I sell you a basket full of apples and the law does not permit you to sell individual apples. Well, that's, that's going to affect your decision-making, right? Because 
Now you can't just take that basket and sell individual apples to people who are coming along. You have to sell the entire basket to somebody else, or you have to consume the entire basket yourself. And so that's going to necessarily affect your decisions. And so we have to think about kind of those, those institutional factors that are going on in the background, because then they're going to shape how you respond to constraints and what the relevant opportunity costs are and things like that. Do you think that property rights and other institutions then are just more important and more interesting to consider than say a strange quirk I I I may have like I side that I actually want less stuff than more things in one particular case or I discount in a strange way is is there an argument to be made that behavioral economics if it's especially if it's just going to use more well defined models is there a case that it's not that it's not interesting to consider these things, but it's sort of, there are other more important things we can do and essentially doesn't really change what economics is fundamentally. Well, I think we jump to conclusions too quickly about what's going on here. So a behavioral economist would tend to look at something like superstitions and they would say, okay, this is clearly evidence of irrationality. Um, but there's an economist, David Levine, who has kind of like his his critique of behavioral economics has been like behavioral economics poses puzzles that economists should want to solve. And he's a game theorist. And so like what he argues is that maybe what's really going on is there's just some level of like strategic behavior or or some other kind of lesson that we can get from game theory to explain it. And so like he has a paper on superstitions, for example, and uh, his paper on superstitions, uh, he thinks about, okay, suppose that you are just playing this huge like game where, you know, you make a particular decision and, um, and, but then like that, that just plays out through some kind of like decision tree. Right. And so if you have a superstition, like, oh, I shouldn't walk under a ladder because that's bad luck or something like that. Well, if I never walk under a ladder and nothing bad happens to me, this kind of reinforces that belief that, um, you know, that walking under a ladder is bad luck. And his point is, is that, well, if you thought about this in game theory, what this is really just saying is that there are aspects of like a decision tree that people just never get to because they don't experiment. They don't deviate from, from this belief. And so the belief just gets reinforced. But they don't experience anything that would ever upset that belief. And so if they don't ever experience anything that would upset that belief, then they just continue to believe it. And his point is, is that, you know, the reason that superstitions ultimately break down is that uh, you essentially have people who take a different path. And so you have somebody who walks underneath every ladder that they come across and nothing bad ever happens to them either. And so then they say, well, look, you know, like I don't have any bad luck and I'm walking under a ladder every day. And that now undermines the belief. And it's because it takes you. But his argument is, is well, that just reveals this whole aspect of like the decision tree that you didn't even know that was available to you. But once you know that it's available to you, now it changes your your sort of optimal behavior. And so his argument is like really that behavioral economics poses these puzzles, but it's not necessarily that people are irrational. Um, it's just that they're making decisions given the information that they have. And that, you know, in, in the case of something like superstitions, where things just seem like obviously um, irrelevant or something like that, uh, to like actual outcomes, um, that they can just be reinforced because uh, people don't deviate from from those beliefs and they get positive reinforcement from engaging in a particular behavior or something or, or negative reinforcement from engaging in a particular behavior that convinces them that that like superstition is correct. Right. That's very interesting. So if we can model these kinds of behaviors using beliefs and information in our typical frameworks, it kind of obviates the need for these sort of extra extra additions that's very interesting i that makes me want to ask what is the most important skill or way of thinking of an economist like how do you say or how does a the economist you just talked about which in that that very insightful way of reformulating a problem 
how does one do that? How do you approach writing a paper, thinking about a problem? To me, I think the best thing is just that um, you have to ignore this impulse to judge people's behavior or to like judge policy and things like that. So if you observe behavior that seems weird, strange, wrong, whatever, um, I think that you have to kind of push down that urge to just conclude that this is like wrong or weird kind of behavior and actually try to understand it. Now, you might try to understand it. And after you try to understand it, you might still conclude, yeah, I still don't understand this. This, you know, this, this doesn't make any sense to me. But if you start with that approach of like, I'm just trying to understand why people make these particular decisions um, and why people behave in the way that they do, it forces you to look for things, right? Like it forces you to think maybe there's some constraint out there that like we're ignoring. So like if maybe, um, you know, we don't kind of, understand uh the constraints that people face when they're making decisions and if we ignore a particular constraint then somebody's behavior might seem weird because we might assume that well they should just do x or something like that but if there's some kind of constraint that says like you can't do x if x is what they want to do they're going to try to do something to sort of approximate x right they're going to try to find some way around to figure out like what the solution is to this uh to this problem. And I mean, there's a lot of, uh, like an example of this is, is kind of like, uh, you know, there's a, there's a paper out there on like trial by battle. And the idea is like, why, why would you ever have trial by battle? This time kind of seems, um, you know, ridiculous that people would just like fight over who actually owns the land. And that's how we're going to determine things and like, look at how uncivilized this sort of thing is. But if you actually study uh, trial by battle, um, what you find is that what would really happen here is, okay, th this was occurring at a time when property rights were not well-defined. There were sort of competing claims to property. So it, it was sort of like emerging out of this like feudal system where people had just been granted privileges to land. But like there was no like exhaustive record keeping of exactly like where the property line was or something like that. And so you had all these disputes over the land. And when you had these disputes, if there wasn't some clearly defined, uh, you know, property line or something like that, then uh, they might use trial by battle. And it sounds completely insane. But what would happen in like these trials is that the people on both sides would actually hire someone to fight on their behalf. And so they would hire someone to fight on their behalf. But there's a critical aspect of this is that if you're going to hire somebody to fight on your behalf, what you're willing to pay like a professional fighter to fight on your behalf is going to be um, it's going to approximate how much value you place on like the land. And so what you actually find out is that when you look through like trial by battle, the battles actually rarely take place. And the reason the battles rarely take place is, you know, who you hired as your fighter, you see who the other person hired as their fighter. And sometimes there's a very clear advantage here where you're like, oh, like my guy is going to lose. Um, and what is that? And so knowing that there's a good chance that you're going to lose, you could just send your fighter out to fight. But if your fighter loses, you get nothing. Or you could go to this other party and you could say, look, let's just let's just make an agreement. And so what you find out is that in these uh, in these periods where you had trial by battle, the vast majority of the time this ended in a settlement because actually hiring the fighter forced these people to reveal how much value they really placed on the land. Mm -hmm. And so then um, given that they've made that commitment, now they could come to the table and they could potentially negotiate a settlement. Right. Could you, that's very interesting. Could you relate that to like a modern day problem? In what ways that might be, might that seemingly strange situation be analogous to say disputes over property rights today? Well, I think the, the basic idea is, is that it just points out that people face particular constraints, right? Like the reason that we don't have things like this today is because we have uh, very um, well-defined property rights, right? Like we have surveyors who come out and, um, and you know, they uh, 
uh, they can identify exactly where the property line is and, and that sort of thing. And so if I build a fence, um, you know, around my yard and my neighbor comes over and says, hey, part of this fence is in my yard. Uh, well, we don't have to have trial by battle to determine whether or not I need to move my fence. Right. Um, there are people who could just come out and they can look at it and they can say, nope, it's, it's not on your land or yep, he did build it on your land or, or whatever. Um, but you know, these kinds of, um, these kinds of differences are just entirely about, uh, you know, the constraints that we face. So today we don't face the same constraints over the definition of property rights. And so, you know, we can resolve these in a much less costly fashion and we can, um, and, and we can solve these problems, you know, fairly quickly. Um, but I think like, you know, there are still property rights disputes. Uh, so like there, there are still instances where there's like poorly defined, uh, property rights. And we kind of talk about these issues a lot on economic forces when we get into, um, issues related to like externalities and all, all these kinds of things, because it's not always clear, um, what, uh, what should be done in these in these cases and the textbook way that we teach about externalities makes it sound super super simple um but oftentimes it's it's not necessarily uh that simple and we have to kind of think about like strategic behavior and people behaving um uh sort of out of the equilibrium of the model right like this is another thing that is kind of difficult for economists sometimes is you write down a model of how humans behave um, but then you you essentially end up describing like equilibrium behavior. So in equilibrium, this is how people behave. Um, but if people have the ability to behave strategically, um, then what we actually observe in reality might differ substantially from, uh, you know, like your particular model. You touched there on externalities and... Perhaps a similar concept is transaction costs in that it sort of encapsulates these things in economics, which you kind of brush under the bed and you go, or you you hope they're they're not too too big or you they're kind of difficult to quantify. I I wonder what you if there's anything interesting to say on difficulties in trying to quantify these kinds of things. And as you say, the ways in which when we try and define a model and try and say, okay, we, we, we think this is going to happen, the, the ways in which actually that can kind of backfire on us. Yeah, I think transaction costs are oftentimes like the thing that people are ignoring. Um, it's almost kind of a joke um, in economics sometimes that like if somebody is behaving in a way that you don't understand and somebody says, well, why are they doing this? You just say, well, it's transaction costs, right? And it's kind of a joke because it sounds like you're not really giving an answer, right? Oh, there's just some transaction cost. Uh, but if you dig into it, like generally this is the case, like there is some kind of transaction costs, uh, like the property rights are not well-defined or the transfer of property rights is hard, or there's like some kind of like measurement problem. Uh, you know, so like um, how do we actually measure what's being, uh, what's being sold or something like that? Like, I mean, you think about, um, back in the days of like the gold standard or something like that, you know, what, what a lot of people say is uh, a lot of people will say, well, you know, states would define some unit of account and that unit of account would be some quantity of like gold or some quantity of silver or something like that. But what they frequently leave out is they didn't just describe the quantity of gold or silver. They described like the fineness of the metal because most of the time, if you had gold or silver, it wasn't pure gold or, or silver. It, it could be gold and, or, or silver or something mixed with, you know, some other metal. And that actually turns out to be really important, right? Because if I just have, um, you know, if I define, you know, um, a dollar as like one twentieth of an ounce of gold, um, I need to also specify, you know, quantity. Uh, or a quality, excuse me, not just quantity. And so I actually need to know like the fineness of the of the metal uh, to actually know if this 
a particular coin is really worth uh, a dollar, you know? And so that's easier said than done, right? You need somebody who's actually an expert in measuring that quality. And so now all of a sudden, you know, this, this leads to forms of, of specialization and this leads to jobs that would never exist, you know, um, outside of that, uh, of that system. And so when we think about transaction costs, they're just kind of everywhere. And, um, and frequently, you know, that is how you explain somebody making a decision that you don't understand. Is there some transaction cost um, that is uh, preventing what looks to be mutually beneficial trade from taking place? Thank you. I mean, sketch, sw switching gears a little bit, I, I wanted to ask about Bitcoin because I know you write about it and you're interested in it. But maybe first, I wanted to ask your opinion on what is money? How should we think about it? And then what does Bitcoin, or what could it do to change that game? Yeah, so if you think about it, like money is just kind of like a record keeping device, right? Like um, you kind of have something like money um, in your own like household growing up, right? So I had a brother and um and in that household i would be given a job to do and sometimes like i didn't want to do that job and so i would tell my brother look hey if you do this um i'll do you know something that you're told to do like later on right like we're exchanging favors or something like that and that works in a household because i know my brother I know that he's going to be there uh, tomorrow. I know that he's going to be there a year from now. I know that, um, you know, like we we have like repeated interactions, right? And because we have those repeated interactions, we can do that. And so sort of uh, in small societies, the same general principle holds. Because even if you think about like, let's say you grew up in like a small town, you might be able to survive on promises, right? Like I... Uh, own a dairy farm or something like that. And I give you milk and, um, and then, um, and like you make clothing. And so like, I provide you with milk. And then there's like this implicit agreement that like, Hey, when I need a new shirt, like you're going to give me the new shirt. And we're kind of keeping track in our own heads, or maybe, you know, like writing it down, right? Like, um, you know, uh, like how much the one person owes, owes the other. And that sort of system can work in a household or a small community, because if somebody ever deviates, if somebody never lives up to their promise, you can punish them, right? You can exclude them from transacting in the future. And so they always have an incentive to cooperate with you. But once you start dealing with strangers, uh, that's all out the window, right? Because I don't know if I'm ever going to interact with this person again. I don't know if I can trust this person. Um, but the fundamental problem of like record keeping hasn't changed. But the way that you do this is like uh, the, uh, Walter Williams, who is a great economist, uh, always said it this way, like um, when you, uh, it's like he would say like, you know, he would go to the meat market and he would say, you know, uh, give me your best ribeye or something like that, right? And he's like, and the butcher looks at you and says, uh, why should I give you a ribeye? What have you done? And he said, and you slap your dollars on the on the table and you say, and um and he's like, but when you're slapping those dollars on the table, really what this could be is like, you've just been mowing a bunch of lawns and people have been paying you to mow the lawns. And like these little pieces of paper uh, signal that you've done something of value for someone, right, to get this money. And so now you're, um, you know, you're, you're sort of passing that along. And so like the dollars themselves are just record keeping devices. They're just keeping track of like, you provided some value to somebody they gave you these pieces of paper. Now you can take these pieces of paper, you can give them to someone else. And that will, um, you know, as, as proof that you've produced something. And then uh, they will accept those things because now that becomes proof that they've provided something of value to someone. And then the process just continues on and on and on. Right. And so I think like, if we think about money that way, money is just, uh, it's just a way of, uh, it's just a record keeping device. It's a way of keeping track of, uh, the value that you've provided for uh, for other people. And so the sort of way that that's related to, to Bitcoin is that um, Bitcoin fundamentally is just like a giant ledger that keeps track of everybody's transactions. So um, if, uh, if you're holding 
Bitcoin today, um, that's an indication that, you know, you've done something to uh, acquire that Bitcoin. So maybe, you know, you, uh, you know, maybe you're a butcher who accepts Bitcoin. And so, you, you know, this is evidence that you've provided something of value to somebody else. Or maybe you've used your dollars to buy Bitcoin, but in which case, like the dollars represent that you provided value to somebody and now you're using that to buy um, the Bitcoin. And so it, but it's keeping track of all of these transactions. And so if you think about it, like um, it's kind of just, uh, it's kind of just that record keeping device. It's kind of the same basic principle that we think about when we just think of abstractions of money. Okay, interesting. Well, I... I have a question here, and, and I think it will relate to Bitcoin, which is, I've been trying to think about the role of money in our in our world today. So I can't think of really a world without money. I don't really see how we could only, say, use credit or only do barter. But I've also been reading some anthropologists who, or historians who look at the history of money and go, well, actually, you know, if you can steal gold and you can, say, pay soldiers with that, and it's a kind of trustless ledger, you could say, then in a way, whether it's commodity monies or it's fiat monies, which can be printed, uh, in a way they can promote violence or they have they have their problems, but but obviously also a huge benefit. So I'm wondering what you think about what what are the and I know it's more philosophical, but what are the pros and cons of money in this sense? And does Bitcoin change anything with that? Well, I think we can't avoid uh, money. Uh, like not having money would make us all substantially worse off because we would have to rely on credit um, right. or barter for for everything. Um, and the fact that we don't rely on credit and barter for everything suggests that money must be serving some role that makes us better off. Otherwise, why would everybody keep using it, right? Like there's no one stopping you from you from bartering. There's no one stopping you from just engaging in like pure credit-based systems. Um I think like the history of money is kind of complicated because on the one hand, you can kind of tell a history of money without thinking about the state at all, because a lot of it is sort of like just the spontaneous actions of, of people, right? Like they, um, you know, like when you think about what emerges as money, the reason something like gold or silver emerges as money is that there's kind of like this last period problem, right? So um, if I was to just, you know, uh, if money didn't exist and I was just to print up a bunch of pieces of paper and say, hey, guys, I have this idea. It's called money. OK, these little pieces of paper, they're going to just be like our record keeping devices. We'll just pass them back and forth. And like that will be how we determine, you know, who produced what. People are going to be very skeptical of this and and for good reason, because one of the issues is, is like, well, what if there's some day in the future where I can't actually take these pieces of paper and give them to someone else? Um, well, in that case, um, in that period, those pieces of paper become worthless. But if the pieces of paper are worthless in that period, then in the prior period, I shouldn't accept them. And but that but if I shouldn't accept them in the previous period, then the person who offers them to me shouldn't have accepted them in the period before that, right? And then backward induction just implies like you shouldn't accept them now at all. And so gold and silver and things like that emerge as money because they solve that last period problem. Like if all of a sudden one day gold is no longer money, well, I'm stuck holding gold, but gold has value and I can go sell the gold for something else or uh, turn it into jewelry or whatever, right? And so there are these practical uses. And so it kind of solves this, uh, this last period problem. And so when you think about how does money emerge or what, or, or what happens, you can see this as entirely spontaneous. Like people kind of search for like what they should use um, as money and what they settle on is things that has, have particular characteristics. They, you know, they want something that's durable. They want something that's portable. They want something that's divisible. Um, they want something that's easy to resell. They want, you know, it, it has all of these different characteristics. And so that's how you end up settling on gold and silver. And you can tell this sort of spontaneous story. And from there, you can also expand that and tell this sort of spontaneous story of how you know banks start to emerge right you have people where you know as different communities interact they might all be using gold and silver but they have completely different ways of of measuring it or like units of value right and so like you know um one place might have you know um uh, the dollar, which is a particular amount of gold, and some place might have the pound, which is a particular amount of gold. 
And those are two completely different amounts. And so if I'm, if I'm holding um, like uh, coins, for example, and some of them are denominated in dollars, some of them are denominated in pounds, and I've never seen pounds before, like, well, how, how do I know what, what this is actually worth? Well, then you have people like money changers who are, you know, promised to, you know, give you local money in exchange for foreign money and, and things like that. And so you can start to, you can tell this entire story without any kind of discussion of the state that kind of will ultimately get you to something that looks like a relatively modern uh, monetary system. But at the same time, like we really can't ignore the state because the state is constantly sort of interfering in this process throughout history. And a lot of the reason that they're doing this is they're doing it because um, uh, it benefits them, right? Like the primary thing uh, when it when it came to money has always been that uh like if you think about when gold and silver emerges money uh a private mint is a huge uh threat to like a king or something right because uh they're literally making money and so if they if the mint wanted to right they could always like shave off a little bit of gold from every coin or something like that that they're that they're minting um, and then keep all of those shavings and turn those into coins. And like they could basically accumulate a bunch of, uh, of gold uh, for themselves. And, and, uh, and if people don't realize that they're doing this, uh, it's not going to depreciate the value. Well, if you raise enough gold, you can potentially raise an army to overthrow the king and you can you know, take over. And so uh, kings would oftentimes take over the mint and they take over the mint for two reasons. Number one, it gets rid of this threat. But number two, it gives them the ability to shave off little parts of the of the coins and things like that and generate extra revenue when they need it. And like during times of war, you know, they can clip the coins and, and shave the coins and that helps them to accumulate more stuff. Now, eventually this leads to kind of like a depreciation uh, in the purchasing power of that of that money. But in the short run, right, that allows them to, to generate some sort of revenue. And over time, like that even though you know we don't use gold and silver as money over time like the state has kind of continuously intervened in that way and they've used the monetary system to their uh to their advantage you know the bank of england used to suspend convertibility during um uh during wartime but they would make this critical promise to like restore convertibility at the pre-war parity before you know like at the end you know um at the end of the war and Economists even uh, found this bizarre because what would happen is you'd experience this inflation during the war and then the war ends and you'd get this huge deflation and it would be really costly and make people very unhappy. And, you know, economists would be like, why, you know, why, why, why do states do this? And the reason is simple is that you actually, um, what these rulers kind of learned is that like, if you just depreciate the value of the currency every time that you go uh, to war, eventually your currency is going to be worthless. Nobody's going to be willing to hold it. Nobody's going to, nobody is going to trust you, that sort of thing. So by making these commitments, you convince people that, hey, over the short run, this is going to be really costly, but over the long run, like the purchasing power will be relatively stable. And that sort of helps to anchor money demand. But that anchoring of money demand actually helps them to raise more revenue through these, through these uh, tactics. And so, um, and so, yeah, I mean, there's there's always been this aspect of state involvement, and it's primarily been to finance massive expenditures like wars and mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. And so, but in some sense, like these these kind of trends are kind of running in parallel because you can you can tell the story of like the emergence of money without really mentioning the state, and you can get pretty far along uh, by doing that. Um, so, in other words, like the state is not really critical to why we have money or why we use money or the types of institutions that emerge. But the state, uh, you know, is kind of like periodically just bumping into that, that thing and, and kind of a, a adapting and adopting the, the institutions to fit their own kind of uh, purposes. And I think that um, if you look at something like Bitcoin, it's kind of related to this in, in, a, in a variety of ways. So number one, the development of Bitcoin came out of this idea that um, that as more and more stuff went on the internet and as more and more commerce went on the internet, um, there would be a lot more like digital transactions 
and digital transactions, unlike say exchanging gold coins or exchanging, you know, paper dollars or, or something, they, um, those kinds of transactions are anonymous, right? If I hand you a $10 bill and you hand, and, and you know, um, to, because I'm buying something from you, that transaction is not recorded anywhere, right? But we know that it took place, but maybe nobody else knows that it, that it took place. And, um, and so one of the things that people were kind of uh, worried about uh, was what happens when everything is digital. Now there's always going to be some third party processing payments. And that third party that's processing payments, they're going to have records of all of your transactions. They're going to know what you're buying. They're going to know what you're doing. They're going to, you know, and, um, and so that creates a problem and it creates a problem because, you know, it's, it's eroding your privacy, uh, but it also creates a problem because what happens if um, the, this third party processor decides like they don't like what you're, what you're buying or they don't like what you're, what you're doing. Well, then they can potentially just de decline the transaction. And so now, even though the two of us want to trade, we, we, we can't necessarily do it. And then on the other hand, um, the other aspect that kind of went into this is that the frequent involvement of the state in the manipulation of the value of money by the state um, was seen as a huge problem by, by some people, right? Is that we, um, you know, the United States temporarily left the gold standard in 1971. And I say, you know, uh, temporarily because it was supposed to be temporary, but here we are, uh, you know, 50 years later and it's, it was never restored. And so there was people who were incredibly, you know, frustrated by the fact that the government can just decide that like one day uh, $35 buys you an ounce of gold. And then um, the next day, you know, $35 gets you like a 20, a 10 and a five. And so, um, you know, people were sort of frustrated by that. And so Bitcoin was designed to be a sort of electronic version of cash, right? That you could just, um, uh, you could just, transfer your balance on this ledger to somebody else and there's no one single trusted third party who could who would be observing that transaction or who could prevent that transaction and then at the same time it kind of uh you know uh within the uh within you know the the code itself you know it limited the amount of bitcoin that could ever exist and so that would prevent anybody from manipulating it. And like, yes, in theory, you could just change the code and make you know the supply that much bigger. But the problem is, is that because it's decentralized, in order for that change to actually take place, all of the people who are operating like nodes on the network would have to upgrade to the higher um, supply. And none of them would have an incentive to upgrade to the higher supply because if you're running a node, chances are you hold some Bitcoin. And if you're holding Bitcoin, you don't want to create a bunch more of it because now that's going to, you know, dilute the value uh, of it. And so, um, and so that's how it kind of ties into all of this, this historical stuff is it's kind of designed to, you know, um, to, to kind of create some kind of electronic version of cash, but then also to kind of limit the state's involvement in, in the supply and sort of the manipulation of the supply for their own purposes. Thank you. Well, Professor Hend uh, Hendrickson, we kind of ran out of time, but <laughs> thank you very much. Um, where where can people f find more about you or your work? Um, I would guess like the average person, you can just find me through my newsletter, Economic Forces. It's on Substack. Uh, we, we um, I write it with a friend of mine, uh, Brian Albrecht, and we we post something like once a week. It's just kind of an application of price theory, and um, and we just kind of try to demonstrate the power of economics and simple economics to explain a lot of uh, what's really going on in the world. So if you find me there, you can, you'll can you be able to find anything else uh, related to me that you want to find uh, through there. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I'll put these links in the description. Well, thank you very much. Yep, thank you.